ask yourself what you're most afraid of. Mm. Um, wow. For you, it might be that book, you know? Ask yourself what you're most afraid of and then kind of rally yourself or begin to think, how am I going to do that? Stephen, there's not many people I, I sit down across from that I can genuinely say change my life. And you are one of those people because of your books. And I, I'm very grateful and honored to sit down with you. Um, so thank you. Hey, thank thanks, you for, for, thanks for having me, Danny. And uh, I hope it was for the good that, <laughs> that your life changed. It's absolutely been for the good. Uh. Um, one thing that I can't help but notice about you is you're so curious where does that come from? Uh, I mean, you're pretty curious too. This is what podcasting is all about. But I mean, I'm just, I'm sure I'm the same as you. I'm just interested in what people are thinking, how they got where they are, what what their journey was, you know, what they hope for for the future. And uh, just to sort of like compare myself to them, you know, because I'm struggling. I'm, I'm groping for, uh, you know, what to go, where to go next or whatever, how to do such and such a thing. So I always want to know kind of like, how do you do it? You know, how did it, what works for you? Um, and maybe I can borrow something from that or learn something from that. Have you always been that way? I think I have. Yeah, I always have. Yeah. And when you look at dissecting people, it's almost like you're doing it as a therapist, it feels like. Like when you're on the Tim Ferriss show, he's like, I'm looking for a therapy session. And you're like, yeah, I can actually, I can help you out with some stuff, but I also need therapy. But like, <laughs> and, and I found that so interesting. So what makes for a good diagnoser of creative blocks? Uh, wow, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, like, I remember when I was, when I was on the Tim Ferriss show, he started talking about, or we started talking about what he was working on, you know, as a writer. He wanted to ask me questions to sort of, come, just what I said to you, you know. Um, what sort of issues do you have? How do you deal with such and such and such and such? And, uh, you know, I was happy to give him whatever whatever I know after all the years of, uh, you know, banging my head into walls and stuff like that. So and it was interesting that the tables turned in that case, and I wound up kind of interviewing him instead of him interviewing me. But that's good because I think who's it, the people that are listening are curious both ways, you know, who's this one guy, who's this other guy, and what, and what conversation are they going to have? So that was great. It was great that it turned into an actual conversation. Yeah. And I think for many people, maybe Tim Ferriss, but I know for myself, you have served as the role for me in my head as the grandfather who's creative and able to get the most out of me creatively. My my actual grandpa, God bless him, incredible man. It, he's an athlete and he's very intellectual and smart, but I would never call him super creative and he wouldn't either. Uh -huh. But you you have you are and you serve that role for me and and many other people. How does that feel exactly for you? Uh it's another great question, Danny. It's like um I realized that over the last few years I've sort of become in that role to people. Um but it's nothing I ever particularly wanted to do or that I even enjoy, you know? Um like the war of art um, I sort of wrote for myself, you know, as much to to sort of um, figure out what I thought about something, you know, put it, putting it down on paper. And I never really thought that people would respond to it. I certainly felt like, I mean, when it first came out, I thought, oh, this book is only, first I thought, I'm the only one that's dealing with this. I thought, you know, I'm the only one that's experiencing resistance. And I was kind of amazed that so many people said, oh, my God, that's in my head, too. And I also thought at the time that this was only for writers and uh, that they were the only ones dealing with the sort of the blank page and, and that kind of stuff. And then I was sort of amazed when actors would tell me, oh, man, we're really, or comedians or photographers or artists, you know, fine artists, painters. And uh, Because wasn't the original title going to be The Writer's Life? Yeah, that was my original title. And then my, my partner slash editor, Sean Coyne, he came up with The War of Art, which is a great, great title. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was I thought it was just for writers, and I didn't even think they would relate to it that much. So anyway, I 
I'm not so sure I really relish this role, mm. but um, it does seem like uh, that's how people are perceiving me, you know, at this late stage of my life. Well, it's so interesting because studying your story, it seems like you never intended to do any of the things that you were doing, and you kind of accepted them with open arms, even though you found yourself teaching or in a mental institution like attending it not not being in the mental institution. i felt like i should have been in it right yeah. but but it's like you kind of accepted the role of the dice of life and you created a story out of it and you embraced it i think a lot of people are in their current situation right now and they're not embracing the moment that they're in because they're like I should be somewhere else. I should be at this place or that place. And I wish I was, I had this many followers or I was in Austin or I was in Los Angeles. Like, uh, it's like, what if you're right where you're supposed to be at all times? Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I don't know if I ever bought that in, <laughs> in the moment, but certainly there's a lot of pressure on young people today. Um, I, I felt, you know, that it was a lot on me when I was young, but it's nothing compared to today mm -hmm. with social media. And I think it drives you crazy. I don't think it's really a, a healthy thing at all. Um, there's just a lot of pressure to, uh, to find your individual calling. And I, in a way, I'm guilty of being part of that, you know, of um, that in a way I'm urging people to do that or trying to, you know, put that out as a kind of a, uh, a model of something to do. But that's, you know, that takes time. You know, for me, I had to go down a lot of dead ends. And I'm sure this is true of a lot of people. Um, but young people, they feel like, oh, I got to make it happen right now, you know, because everybody else is making it happen and I'm not. You know, So it's a, it's a lot of pressure. I, I, I don't envy you guys that are, uh, that are struggling with that. And yet, you know, you say social media causes problems, but you're on social media and you're, you're posted on Instagram. And yeah. I was curious about that. What, what's happening there? And, and why, why has that been one of the mediums you've used to put out your message? Well, it's like when uh, my first piece of fiction came out, The Legend of Bagger Vance, and the second one, uh, Gates of Fire, this was like in the 90s. And the world was completely different. The publishing world was completely different then. Do um, you want me to go into detail a little bit about I this? I love that. Um, you know, first of all, in those days, there were newspapers. People actually read newspapers. You probably haven't, you know, never read news. You probably get your news from, you know, the phone somehow, right? Yes. But people read newspapers and and and. Newspapers had book reviews. And also, this was before Amazon. It was before Google, I think, so that the way a book got published was only through a certain limited number of the big five publishing companies, right? So there were gatekeepers. And it wasn't like there were a million books being published a year. So in any event, what I'm sort of getting to, and also there were book reviews, like the Boston Globe, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Dallas Morning Herald, you know, the whatever. All the newspapers around the country had book review sections. And that was how, if you were a writer, you got the word out, right? So that when a book was published, you know, you could, you could check the newspapers and there'd be a review, you know? And then people who were readers would know and would buy it. That all ended, you know? It, it sort of newspapers, you know, went into the toilet when the digital age came in. There were book reviews stopped happening. And so if you're a writer, and I can remember this was like, for me, like seven or eight, nine books ago, I suddenly realized this next book is going to come out and it's going to sink like a stone. Nobody's going to know it's even there, you know? And um, so I thought, I got to do something. And I'm sure every writer at the time thought about that. How am I going to replace this world, this vanished world of book reviews and newspapers and stuff like that. And so I finally, after kind of groping and groping and groping, I've sort of realized, you know, to be on a podcast like with you is a, is a way of getting the word out about a new book. And, and um, there really isn't anything else other than if you have your own following and you can, you know, talk to them. Um, you know, somebody like Joe Rogan, if he has something come up, he can talk to his 10 million followers and, and, uh, it's the equivalent of TV shows or newspapers or something like that in the old days. So I've just sort of had to do it, but, um, 
I don't particularly, I feel like it's, it's probably like 30% of my time, you mm. know, which is not good, <laughs> you know? I mean, I want to be able to be writing and working 100% of the time, but uh, you just can't these days. It's just not the way things work. I don't like to usually interrupt these podcast episodes, but if you could do me one favor, just hitting that subscribe button, 90% of you are not subscribed. And when you do, we can have better conversations and better guests. The road to 100,000 subscribers begins now. So I, I've had to sort of, like you know, so many other writers, had to find some way to, to get the word out about a new book. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you, you spend, so you say 30% of your time is on promoting yeah. and 70% of your time is on the actual writing. Yeah. What would you suggest for new writers? Ah, uh, I mean, it's even harder for new writers because at least, you know, I've had a little bit of a head start where I did have a few books that people know me from before Google, before Amazon, before the world changed. New writers, it's, you know, boy, it's again, it's tough. First, first of all, because the competition is so, so, so vast out there. And if you're a new writer, you know, um, what was I thinking about the other day? Uh, uh, oh, it was Cormac McCarthy, mm -hmm. the guy who wrote The Road and No Country for Old Men and All the Pretty Horses and all that kind of thing. You know, who, he just died, I guess, a, you know, a few months ago. But it was a story of how when he started, he like his first four or five books didn't find any readership at all. And the only kind of reason why he was able to keep surviving was his editor and his publishing house believed in him enough to keep public and just giving him just enough money to keep body and soul together, but also for him to learn the craft, you know? And so it probably took him, I don't know, 15 or 20 years before he sort of really found his voice. And I guess the book that did it was All the Pretty Horses, which was like, I don't know, his seventh or eighth book or something like that. But for young writers today, that doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? Because Nobody's going to sponsor you for those first. So it's sort of like um, like Elizabeth Gilbert, you know who she is from Eat, Pray, Love and Big Magic. Um, she said a great thing to herself. She sort of made a deal with herself uh, when she first started out. And she said sort of she talked to her, to her writing and she said, I will never ask you to support me. I will support you. Meaning she'd work as a barista She'd do whatever she had to do to make money so she could have the time to write and, and, and to learn and to learn her craft. So it's tough. Anybody that's starting out now and thinking that uh, their writing or their or they're even their podcasting, I mean, podcasting is probably more profitable than writing, is going to support them right away. I mean, it's a million to one shot. It's like trying to be a rock and roll star because – you can't who do, who writes great stuff right out of the box other than Philip Roth or Scott Fitzgerald, you know? It takes years and years. And uh how are you going to support yourself for that time? You have to find some kind of a way. So, um it's it's tough to do it. And yet more and more people want to do it these days, which, you know, God bless them. It makes it harder and harder for it yeah. to actually work out. I mean, yeah. on the advice for for young writers you you have two things one is talent is bullshit uh, <laughs> i've seen a million writers with talent it means nothing you need guts you need stick to itiveness it's work you got to work do the freaking work that's what you're gonna that's why you're gonna make it son you work no one can take that away from you and two the work is everything and i'll tell you something else appreciate these days these days when you're broke and struggling they're the best days of your life you're gonna break through my boy and when you do you'll look back on this time and think this is when I was really an artist, when everything was pure and I had nothing but the dream and the work. Enjoy it now. Pay attention. These are the good good days. Be grateful for them. I, I say that all the time. Like, if no one knows your name, that's a good thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in, in a sense of like, the work is more pure and you have a place to go, a dream to get. And when you're in that state, you have ambition, you have hope. And hope is sometimes what people lose when they're on the other side of it. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of truth to that, Danny. Now, that quote you just read is actually a quote from my real-life agent who was like 50 years older than me at the time that he told me that. Um, 
And uh, I, I think it is really true that those are the best times and the times that you'll look back on. But they're also incredibly stressful times because you're wondering, am I ever going to get anywhere at all? Uh, am I doing the right thing? Do I have any talent? Do I have any, anything to say to the world? So, um, but yeah, that is, those, are the great, those are the great times. And I don't feel that way. Like, I don't, uh-huh. I don't feel like, am I ever going to get anywhere at all? Because I know, even by virtue of no one knowing my name, I've gotten a lot of places. Uh-huh. You understand? Like, uh-huh. I've gotten in the room with you, uh-huh. right? I've, I've gotten in the room with, with people who inspire me and who've shaped my worldview. And I've become better as a result. So the real winning to me is not that people know me, it's that I've become a different person in the process. And if you write for 10 years, if you podcast for 10 years, you will be a different person by virtue of you doing it, not necessarily that you will be known by more people. Hmm. What do you think about that? I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I've I've been sort of uh, uh, working on a... a um, not a, a lecture or anything, but a kind of a, a talk that, I, that I'm going to do with a, a friend of mine. And one of the questions that I sort of ask myself and that, and that you know, uh, aspiring artists or podcasters or writers ask themselves is, what if you never make it? You know, what if you never succeed at all? And I think the real answer to that is just what you said, Danny, that the payoff is what the change that happens in you, that to be an artist, even an aspiring artist that never actually breaks through into any commercial area, you change and you grow and you, you connect with, you know, they talk about meditation or um, all of these disciplines that are supposed to connect you to your, to your deeper self or your authentic self or whatever it is. But a pursuit in the arts really does that, you know, because this is one of the things, you know, Robert Greene is Ryan Holiday's mentor and friend. And one of the things I really admire about kind of his philosophy is it's really about the work. You know, it's when you spend seven years or five years working on a particular project or even one year or something like that, the reward is the work itself. You know, I mean, you wish you're going to make some money. You wish that, that sort of stuff happens. But you change. I, I mean, I was just asking you before we started, how have you changed and how has podcasting helped you? And the journey does force you to to ask yourself, what do I really care about, right? What's important to me? Who am I? What do I love? What brings me joy? What doesn't bring me joy? And uh, you find out who you really are in the process and you do change. I mean, do you have any ambitions uh, as a writer, as a filmmaker, as a musician, or anything like that above and beyond podcasting? Absolutely. I put out on Twitter today, what is your biggest resistance right now? I put out to people who follow me. Uh-huh. And someone asked me, what's my biggest resistance? Uh-huh. And I said, probably writing my first book. Uh-huh. Because that to me seems like the thing that is beyond my scope and beyond what I can do. I know I can sit down and have a conversation with an an interview with some of my favorite people in the world that don't know me, but I don't know if I can actually sit down and write that book. So, Uh and I've said that on episode 305 of this podcast, and now I'm saying it again Uh on on episode 419 Uh or 422. So it's interesting how that comes back. Is it a specific book, Danny, that you have in mind? No, Uh it's not. It's the process of being a writer is intimidating Uh to me because I grew up being or thinking that that was the highest calling, Mm -hmm. being a writer. I read so much. Mm -hmm. That that was the safe place for me, Mm. you know? So to this, at this point, if I had to say to you, okay, tomorrow you're going to sit down, you're going to start, would you have an actual book or would you have to be sort of, I mean, that you knew you wanted to write or would you be groping around for what it was? I'd be groping around for Uh what it was. And that's probably why I haven't started Uh because it, and, and that's maybe not the right answer, but- um, you, you talk about, well, you, you said, you were asked, what distinguishes the books that come fast and easy versus the ones that are more difficult? And you said, it seems the hard ones don't work. The easy ones do. Even the easy, easy ones are hard in that there, there are a lot of technical problems to solve. But it, it requires, it's easier for, it, it just flows. Like you mentioned one book where you had 800 pages 
of writing, you had to get it down to 300. Mm. And that was a difficult process to do. But the actual 800 pages were easy to just get onto the page. Mm. More or less, that's true. It was gates of fire. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. So, so what would you recommend to me as somebody who's all over the place and doesn't actually have that idea fleshed out, but knows in their heart they'd like to be a writer? Well, at some point, you got to come up with something, right? <laughs> I mean, if, if, uh, if I would say to you, Danny, what, what books are out there that you love? Yeah. You know, what do you, what that you say, oh man, I wish I had written that. Ah, uh -huh. These three are pretty good places to start. The War uh -huh. of Art, Turning Pro, and Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be. Three, three of my favorite books uh -huh. by uh, none other than Stephen Pressfield. So you would want to write some sort of a, uh, uh, I don't want to say self-help, but something like that, something that was... My uh, generation doesn't look down upon self-help, uh, you know, like yours probably uh, does. <laughs> but <laughs> is, is that accurate? Uh, I think maybe so, yeah. Yeah, I, because I... I, I mean, I hate to characterize those as self-help right. books, you know? What would you rather they be characterized as? I would say they're books about, about something specific, about the creative process. Yes. You know? Um, but... Uh, because most self-help books are, are bullshit. You know, they're mostly, they're written by people who need help themselves. You know, it's like I, I read some of these things and I think, would I actually admire this person? Is this anybody I want to emulate? Mm. And most of the time, it's not. But somehow I think that's the easiest first book to write. It's crazy. It's like if you're, if a person is struggling with certain issues, why would they then write a book that sort of answered that? You know, maybe it's because they're talking to themselves and they're sort of, you know, groping to find their own way. But uh, I would, you know, uh, I think it's okay to start there just to sort of get your feet wet. But I would encourage any writer to, to move on from that f fast, you know, to something else, to fiction or to something like, uh, like what Robert Greene does, you know, uh, sort of um, big idea nonfiction, you know, where you address some real issue out there, like the 48 Laws of Power or something like that, something that, that nobody else has touched, you know? But then again, it also is what's coming out of your heart? Who are, who are you? What's, what's that all about? I, I could talk about this for a long time. Me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like you don't choose it, right? Yeah, that's really what I just was about to say was that uh, I have found that uh, certainly not just fiction that I've written, but other stuff, I never, I didn't have the idea until I had the idea, you know, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. until the goddess gave me the idea. And when the idea came, it, it was always a surprise to me. It was not like... Um, uh, like I could have a five-year plan and say, well, in two years, I'm going to work on this, and then four years, I'm going to work on that. It's always like an idea sort of grabs me from nowhere, and I say to myself, like, really? Me? Is that something I'm going to write? Uh, and, and I usually think, this is really a dumb idea, you know? <laughs> this is not a commercial idea. Nobody's going to lie. It's not, and why should, you know? But then uh, once I get into it, then I become kind of consumed by it. So it, I, I think, you know, when they talk, and I say this myself, that a writing career is a way of finding out who you are, right? But it's always a surprise because you look back on the books that you've written and you go, why did I write that? Where did, I would never have picked that as a subject. But once I, once I did it, once I got into it, it seemed completely natural. Is this making any sense? Danny, like, uh, you know... Um, it's the same for podcast guests, or it's the uh, same for questions in a podcast. Uh, Where does that question come from? It is just what you're genuinely interested in. But I think what is interesting is removing the layers of judgment to yeah. get to the truth of what you actually want to ask or the person you want to have on. Yeah, so, so true, yeah. Maybe the game is about removing the judgment or, or tampering that down, that conscious mind yeah. that is just, oh, self-help is bad, I can never be uh. a self-help <laughs> author, because I'm sure that thought went into your head. And if that thought went into your head, I would have never stumbled upon your books. And, uh -huh. and or if you allowed that idea to consume uh -huh. you, you wouldn't have impacted so many people the uh -huh. way you have. Yeah, I think you're, you're onto something there, Danny. It's like, and this is part of, I think, why this process makes you grow. Mm. Because what 
what you're talking about is a preconceived notion that, like, let's say you say, I want to be a writer, and I put some punch pages in front of you. The natural thing is to sort of start to get in your head, oh, well, I'm now, I'm a writer. I better start writing like Hemingway did or like some, you know, and you're absolutely right that before you can write what you should do, you got to get rid of that. And I think I've found that when you start writing something that you think is dumb or you think nobody's going to be interested in this but me, that's when you're actually doing the real work. You know, that's when your real voice comes out. When you're thinking, oh, I got to write a story about uh, how I was abused when I was a child or my addiction years or, you know, all that sort of stuff, you're not even unless that's your absolutely real story. But even then, you know, you know, what I mean, it, when you but when you start saying, well, let me write a story about a planet in the outermost galaxy that's inhabited by frogs, you know, now you're talking, you know. Or, or somebody that's, you know, like Game of Thrones. Where did that come from, you know? But I'm, I'm sure that when George R. R. Martin sat down to do that, he must have thought to himself, is anybody going to give a shit about this? You know, I mean, uh, dragons, you know, the ar- but, you know, it was coming obviously from his heart, so it worked. What are the conditions that you find help make for the ideas come about most often? Uh, you mean like how do you get ideas? Or is, is that where do ideas come from? And that's how do a you... great question. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely a believer, as you know, from uh, in another dimension of reality, a higher dimension of reality, and what the Greeks, you know, uh, characterize as the the muses, the nine uh, goddesses who were who were their job was to inspire artists which was kind of the way the ancient Greeks looked at it was it was a mystery that they didn't really know where do I where do ideas come from so they said well they come from the gods you know they give us the they whisper the goddess whispers in your ear and I think that's there's a lot of truth to that you know so I'm sort of always have my radio tuned to the cosmic radio station and and looking for waiting for ideas to come in and um and they do come in you know uh and they sort of sneak in um like uh, you, you want me to go into like the process for me usually is um i'll have like a just a germ of an idea you know a book about alexander the or something like that right and i'll immediately sort of dismiss it I say, oh, I can't do that. It's too much, you know. And then, but then, two or three weeks or a month later, I'll find that that idea is sort of still percolating in there somewhere, and I'll start to take it a little more seriously. And then another sort of thought will come in. I think a lot of times, books or creative things are two or three different things that are unrelated coming together, and the synergy of them is is uh, you know makes the idea happen. You know, like. Um, the, the movie Blade Runner, the first Blade Runner. Do you remember the first Blade Runner no. with Harrison Ford? Did you see the new one with uh, Ryan Gosling? And Will Ferrell? Uh, Is Will no. Ferrell Blade Runner? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway. Well, anyway, yeah. take my word for it. It's I two will. ideas that come together. Like in that case, it was the idea of a detective story and a sci-fi movie coming together. So a science fiction detective story with all of the... Uh, um, uh, visual cues that a Sam Spade movie or or a Mar- Marlowe movie would have had, but set in some kind of crazy future with replicants and stuff like that. Um, you should watch Ryan Gosling's uh, Blade Runner 2 to 2049 or the original one with Harrison Ford. It's really good. Blade Runner from 1979, I think. Anyway, I forgot what I was even talking about, but I guess what I was going to say was that an idea comes in kind of in stages for me over time. Mm. And maybe six months or nine months after the, the first initial impetus, I'll suddenly, I'll sort of sort of see the idea there and I'll go, oh, that's not bad. You know, I could, I could do something with that. And by that time, I've almost forgotten. Like if you ask me, when did this first appear to you? I've almost forgotten when it first happened. But it, it kind of comes in stages. But it's all, it's, uh, the receptivity 
is a big part to it. Like I say, being tuned to the cosmic radio station, you sort of have to have your radio on and you have to be kind of turning, tuning the dial and waiting to see if there's a, a song out there in the ether that you can glom onto. And, but it, it's, for me, it, it's always there. Something always does come. There's always another bullet in the chamber. Do you always, when you have an idea, do you always say to yourself, that's a bad idea? Almost always. There's a, almost always. Does I that say it. something about you or does that say something about ideas? Uh, here's, here's what I think it really is. Are you, now, are you familiar with the idea of the hero's journey, the concept of the hero's journey? Um, you know that uh, there's a part of the hero's journey called the call, right? The call to adventure, right? And so the hero is usually like Luke Skywalker is in some, you know, on the uh, evaporator farm of his aunt and uncle. And the call to adventure comes when R2-D2, he finds him in the scrap heap. And there's a little thing where he says, uh, where Princess Leah hologram comes, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope, right? So that's the call to adventure uh, in, in any sort of hero's journey. And the next beat, according to Joseph Campbell, is the refusal of the call. Almost always, the hero gets presented with a call to adventure, and the first thing the hero does is go, no, 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 not for me. And so I think that's sort of natural. Usually what happens next in the hero's journey is that a mentor will appear. Like in Star Wars, it's Obi-Wan Kenobi who says, yeah, let's go to you know, help the rebellion or whatever it is. Um, so for me, when I have an idea and I immediately reject it, that's the refusal of the call, in my opinion. And I think if, if you don't have that, something's wrong. Mm. I mean, I think if you immediately embrace it, it's not the, sort of the way the hero's journey works. Because I think like, like you with your book that you want to write, mm -hmm. you're in the point right now of the refusal of the call. Mm -hmm. And the reason you're, that you're refusing it is because it's a really serious thing for you. It's like, it's, it's, it's really important and it's scary. And that's, if it wasn't scary, you wouldn't do it. You, you wouldn't have that moment. I mean, let me ask you this. When you first had the idea to podcast, mm -hmm. did you have a moment where you said, no, no, I don't want to, that's too much for me? It was very brief. I wanted it to be phone calls initially. But then when I went into it and started doing it, it happened nonstop. Like I couldn't stop doing it. Uh -huh. So did you have a moment where you said no or that you got over it or did you immediately go for it? In my head, it, I immediately went for it. Uh -huh. But if I were to think about it, I, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, for me, it, it doesn't work that way. I almost always have a moment where I say no, no, no. And I have to sort of be, I have to sort of convince myself or be convinced. That's interesting. The, the next phase would be the mentorship role. And you've had some incredible mentors in your life. And I'm curious, Paul Rink, Simon Sinek, uh, Norm Stahl. Or yeah, a few well, you did your good, re good research here, Danny. <laughs> uh, but I think also sometimes a me that mentor can be inside your own head. Yes. You know, and a lot of times you're your own mentor. Yes. Or... You'll have a dream. That's a big thing for me. I'm a big believer in dreams, that dreams are coming from your, you know, your soul, your true self, you know, guiding you. And a lot of times I will have dreams where I'm, if I'm in doubt about something, where a dream will sort of come to me and say, go ahead, do it. That's the thing. And that's my, my internal mentor and i think i think it's true for all of us but a lot of people don't pay attention to their dreams you know you, it's a it's a uh, a muscle you have to kind of use i think do you write down your dreams i definitely do or i record them you know and and what are you looking for and in terms of can you give an example of some time where you've had a dream and then you followed the call of the dream uh let me see if i can think of one um well, here's one thing for me in my dreams. Uh, first of all, let me recommend a book to anybody that's listening here. It's called, um, it's by Robert Johnson. It's called Inner Work. And it's about, Robert Johnson is a Jungian therapist. And this, is, this book is about interpreting dreams. And it's a real simple, short book like The War of Art. But it's really, it's, it's really great, the technique that he gives you. But for me, 
whenever water appears in a dream for me, particularly like spring water coming out or a river that's suddenly flowing someplace, that is always for me a symbol of creativity. Mm. And when I have when I have a dream, like I, I just had one the other night where uh, there was a, a lake sprung up in front of my house and a river. And, uh, and I thought, oh, this, this is good. Whatever, whatever I'm working on now, I got to, you know, kind of ride the flow of this thing right away. So I've definitely had uh, dreams like that where I've been wondering, um, should I go ahead on this? Is this project worth it? And I'll have a dream where I'm on a river or whatever it is. And, and, uh, and I feel like that's my inner guidance, my inner soul telling me, go ahead, you're onto something, this is, this is the right thing to do. It's funny because I've started to ask people, if I pray for you, what should I pray for? And ah, that's a great question. Yeah. Ah. And I'm curious to get your answer. But what was interesting to me is the most common answer. You want to... Yeah, what? Yeah, what do you think the most common answer to that question is? I've asked <sighs> 10 to 15 people over uh, the past few weeks. Wow. Uh, um, find me love. That, that, that's... That could be a good one. Uh-huh. Clear vision, uh-huh. which uh-huh. speaks to what your dreams help you yeah. do. Yeah. They help solidify well, the vision. That's really interesting, isn't it? it? Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. I I wouldn't expect that. Now that you say it, though, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. You know? When we have a direction to go to, we are most in our purpose. It feels like we're in a calling. We're in the place where we're yeah. moving forward. Yeah. What about I that? Mean, in a sense? way, you interviewing me now, which. You know, I'm a bit of a mentor to you, apparently. That's, I'm sure that's part of what you're looking for. You're sort of hoping that I'm going to say something, you know, that you can go, oh, that really helps my, my clear vision, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, and, and hopefully for someone listening, too, they're yeah. listening to learn more about creativity, your own journey, yeah. and, and helping them have clear vision. Yeah, and if that's you, interesting, yeah. And I've never thought about this before, but if a podcast can be glasses, like to give somebody a more clear vision of like, Oh, this guy was a writer for this long, and this is what he did, and this was his journey. Wow, I could do that too, potentially. Yeah, I mean that's what you hope is going to happen every time, right? I certainly that's when I listen to a podcast. That's what I hope. You know, I hope oh this person's going to say something, and I'm going to go oh wow, that's exactly where where I'm at, and what a great answer, and what a great thing that they did, or that they'll inspire me by their own example. You know, I'll say oh I got to be like I got to do what he did, or you know what she did. Yeah. So for that question, what what comes to mind? If I pray for you, what should I pray for? Ah, um, that's a good question. I think I might say clear vision. You know. Wow. Yeah. And and I think which the, is what I'm hoping I get from my dreams. Yes. You know, and what I do get. Yeah. W- when was the moment in your life you felt most clear on where you were going? Ah, uh, it's a it's a. First of all, I would answer, it's a, it's a great question, that there are many, it's not one. Yeah. Um, um, but it's, uh, it was the moment I talk about in the War of Art where um, I had been kind of running away from writing for like five or six years, and I had always kept my typewriter with me. I sort of had this dream to be a writer, but I never, I had done it, spent like two years in a failed attempt to write a novel and it was that was so bad for me um my life sort of went out of control um that i thought i'm never going to do this again that's the worst thing to do even though i couldn't throw away my typewriter and then i had a moment when i was in this sublet apartment in new york blah 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 i sat down uh, and just did two hours at the typewriter for no reason at all, not not writing anything specific. And when uh, all this, I'll go the longer version of the story. When I, f- I got up from this, and I went out to do the dishes. There was a bunch of dishes in the sink, and as I was washing them, I found that I realized I was whistling. In other words, I was kind of happy, and I realized that that t- those two hours of writing had somehow grounded me, and that this period when I hated it and was afraid to do it was over, and that I was now able, not only able to at least sit down, but that it would give me something, it would give me strength, it was a grounding thing. Instead of being something that was gonna destroy me, it was something that, uh, uh, you know, it's like I finally found my source of energy and that it worked. And, uh, 
But again, to what I'm saying about taking many, many, it was like another 25 years before I actually got a book published. But something changed in that moment. Yeah, but er everything changed in that moment. So, and again, that's sort of a mystery. I have no idea why other than, you know, I'd maybe been struggling for long enough that, you know, the dam broke or the fever broke or something. But on some deeper level, on the un in the unconscious or something, something changed at that moment. What I find so fascinating is the second part, about, which I forgot, which is about you doing the dishes. Mm. And that speaks to literally my first question for you was, what do you like about doing the laundry? <laughs> ah, really? That's well, how did you go? How did you come up with that question? We do our research here. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question because I, I think maybe it's a it's a uh, a parallel to that that I sort of like the idea of um, doing something simple that cleans things. You know that when it's done, whether it's doing the dishes or doing the laundry, you've got you know you fold your shirts, you fold your underwear, and you're ready to go. You know. Uh, I guess it's just a, a ritual for me, you know. When you clean your physical space, you also clean your mental and internal space as well. Definitely, I think so. Do you? Would you agree? I was cleaning my place this morning, not even realizing any of this, and it it made me feel better. It made me feel like I got I have momentum. I'm uh, on the right the right place. I'm going in the right direction. Yeah. You know, all the dishes are clean. All yeah. the I've wiped down all the the countertops. I'm yeah. like wow, this feels great. When I uh, come back to my apartment. You're like me, Danny. I'm the same way, yeah. And it just, that gets you into a better state to create, yeah. to build. And it, and it puts you on the right track in life. So it's like, if you are struggling, it's like, maybe just start with the smallest thing of cleaning your physical environment. I think there's a lot to that. I mean, if, as you were talking about that, I was just thinking of an image of, you know, Zen monks where they sweep out the place or they rake the sand, you know, and get everything exactly right. And I don't know, I was reading about Aaron Sorkin, the writer, that he says that he sometimes takes eight showers a day. Have you heard this? No. And like while he's writing, if he sort of gets stuck, he'll go, oh, I got to get clean. And he sort of takes a shower and then comes back. And it's, it's probably the same concept, you know? Let me wash all this bad stuff off and get a clear head again, and I'll start again. Wow. Seven or eight showers, I don't know about that, but it's the same concept. On that topic, what did you learn in 1990 at the Healing Center? Ah, uh, I'm trying to... Oh, that's... Uh, well, you have done your research, but um, this was... Uh, uh, in Glendale, California, right in, right in, Mas in Pasadena, uh, there was a place at that time called the Healing Light Center. And I had a friend, I still have a friend, his name's Tony Keppelman, and he got into hands-on healing, you know, where you know the, where you run energy through people up from the soles of your feet, da-da-da-da-da-da. And uh, the short version of it is that uh, there were some women out there, it was pr primarily women at the Healing Light Center, who could really, when they would put their hands on you, it wasn't like you felt a little tiny tingle. I mean, you felt voltage coming through you, you wow. know? And so that, among many other things, really reinforced in me the idea that there's a lot of shit going on out there that we don't know anything about, you know? And particularly, again, creativity, the muse, the goddess ideas coming in, the cosmic radio station. There's a lot of stuff going on out there that... Uh, we can't put our finger on, we can't measure, we can't see, but it's the source of everything, you know? I have to really think that, that that's the artist's job, is to tune in to that other dimension, and uh, a dimension where ideas come from. Yes, I agree. And part of that is differentiating between the ego and the, the soul, or the self. Yeah. And, you know, this is so foundational to my worldview, what you talked about in 2002 in The War of Art, like... Uh -huh. Death is an illusion. Time and space are illusions. All beings are one. The supreme emotion is love, and God is all there is. Would you still agree with that or write that? Today? Yes, I would, yeah. Wow. Now, what, what the context of that was that I was trying to draw a distinction between the material plane that we live on where we have certain things are true like a, and, and the higher plane where different laws are true. Like on the material plane, we have a body and we can die. 
So we believe that there's death, right? Um, on the material plane, you and I are different individuals. I can hurt you and it won't hurt me. On the material plane, the primary emotion, in my opinion, is fear. Because we know we can die, we know we can be hurt, you know, all of the things we do, if you think about it, even having children, writing books, having insurance policies, is really all about, oh my God, I'm going to die, what's going to happen to me, you know, da, 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 da. But on the higher plane, you know, where the gods live, just the, the laws apply that you just said, death is not real, time and space are not real, you know, the gods travel swift as thought, as they say, right, you want to be on Jupiter, you're there, you know. Um, and the supreme emotion, and also, we're all one, so that if I hurt you, I hurt myself, right? That's the law of karma. And, uh, and on that higher dimension, the primary emotion, in my opinion, is not fear, but love, right? Because we're all, we're all one. But to get to that place, that's a whole other thing. You know, it's easy to talk about. <laughs> but I think that that place is where ideas come from. And it's the artist's job, in my opinion, to, to open the pipeline. That's the skill that you spend all those years trying to develop, I think. Not, not just the skill of, let's say you want to be a filmmaker. You have to learn what a camera is. You have to learn where to, all that stuff, right? There's a whole thing you could study for years. But what you're really learning is how to open the pipeline to that other, that other world where ideas come from. Just what you said about getting rid of those thoughts of what you think you should be doing. Yeah. For me, meditation has been the number one way to open the pipeline. Ah. For you, what, what's the, the best way? For me, it's just sitting down and, and working, which is probably my form of meditation. You know, yeah. I, probably, I probably enter a state, whether I realize it or not, that's, that's like what you're talking about. In meditation, I mean. Yeah, and, and how would you recommend people go about finding that for themselves? I mean, for me, it was just a matter of just beating my head into the wall for years and years, you know, of, uh, and failing, you know, because I was for years trapped in that same thing you were talking about, sitting down and becoming self-conscious, thinking about, uh, you know, uh, what, is it, what is an idea that people are going to like or, or that kind of thing, or... Just being self-conscious, you know, and not not being able to sort of trust trust what was trust my instinct and trust what was coming out of out of my fingers, you know, and believing that I actually had something to say, which you know uh, I still don't believe is true. I think it Why? comes from another place, you know. Why don't you believe that you have something to say? Um, I just, uh, or it right, comes a, from another place. Well, a better question is, uh -huh. why don't you believe that you are a vessel that can be channeled? That I do believe. I know. Yeah. So, so it's like, how do you live as that vessel? Uh, well, you, uh, I mean, that's the artist's life, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, do you really want me to answer that question? Is Absolutely. That, uh, I mean, I think that if somebody asked me, uh, what my occupation was, I would say I'm a servant of the muse. I'm a servant of that other dimension. And whatever assignment the goddess gives me, I'm going to I'm going to enact that assignment, you know? So I think a big part of it is a kind of humility. You know, first of all, realizing that uh, songs that you might write, they don't come from you, you know? They're coming from some other place. And respecting that. Um, showing reverence and deference to that. And then, meanwhile, making yourself by hard work and concentration and focus and effort and dedication, making yourself a vessel or an instrument so that when the idea comes, you're capable of doing something with it. You have the skills to do some. And I don't just mean writing skills or songwriting skills, but the skill to take something that you might have to work for two years on or three years on without any income coming in and do, facing all of the self-sabotage and all of the other things that uh, I talk about in the War of Art. When you... W w what makes you laugh? But when you sighed like that, I was wondering, what, what were you thinking, Danny, at that moment? I was thinking that 
it's remarkable to get a master class from somebody who spent so much of their time thinking uh, about this uh, and like to actually feel that. And I just wanted to feel uh, that moment uh, for a second. Uh, and you said before about the assignment and, and to understand when the muse gives you the assignment that, you know, you didn't choose that and that you have to do your best with the assignment that you've been given. I view the present moment like that. Mm-hmm. Regardless of if you're working or not, mm-hmm. when you're when you're doing your your dishes, uh-huh. you got the assignment to do the dishes. How well can you do the dishes? Uh-huh. When you speak to a random person on the street, that's your assignment. The present moment is always your assignment, mm. and the muse is giving you that as a way for you to be where you are. And think about the person who's just. I mean, I was talking to the Uber driver here on the way here. Mm-hmm. He was saying ninety five percent of people don't talk to him uh-huh. on, on his rides uh-huh. and 5% do. Oh, that's interesting. And 95% of people to me are missing the assignment, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And he's like, it, it's different when the 5% come in the car mm. because they're present, they're f- asking questions or they want to talk. Uh-huh. He said, you know, it's it just the 5%. Be the 5%. Be the someone who is uh-huh. present to the creation uh-huh. of life as it is happening. I like that, Danny. That's great. You know? Yeah. So I guess how has being a writer or a creative made you a better human being? Ah, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think you, in order to do it, to do the work, you have to, like I say, you, you have to have a present, you have to be present, just what you're talking about. You have to learn how to be present to not so much to the the moment that's in front of you in the physical world, but the moment that's in front of you, you know, that's coming in from another dimension. So you have to learn to do that. And to do that, you have to, you know, efface your own ego because your own ego will block that, right? And you also have to have a, a real humility and a receptiveness to things that you can't see or feel or anything like that. So you've become more spiritual that way, you know? And, uh, and like I say, you also have to have, uh, have developed self-discipline, the ability to self-reinforce all so that you can handle the assignment, right, when it's given to you. Because a lot of times, I mean, when I, for years, I wasn't able to handle that assignment, you know? I wasn't getting the assignment, and if I did get it, I wasn't able to handle it. Um, so I think that, that's a... That, that makes you a better person too, because you have to uh, um, discipline yourself, block out certain bad things, you know, certain negative things, and just focus on on what you're doing. Um, so, I do think it's like it's like a practice in yoga, to me, or meditation, or martial arts, or any of the things that people do. Um, that. Uh, it's using a an activity in this dimension, like yoga, you know, hatha yoga or asana yoga, to achieve to reach another dimension, and that's a good thing. I mean, are we spiritual beings living or whatever? You know, yeah. I think we are, um, and and this is a way of contacting that that dimension. I spoke to this woman, Candice Burt, for the podcast. Have you heard of Candice no. Burt? Uh. She ran. 200 ultra marathons in 200 straight days. Wow. And when you talk to really? her, wow. yeah. I mean, and her knees are still functioning. Huh? And she wasn't injured once. Uh, she wasn't sick once. Wow. And she's like, it's all, it's all in the mind. Uh, and you talk to her and I, I'll publish a podcast with her later this week. And it's like looking or talking to like a spiritual being. Mm. It's like talking to a monk. Mm. It's like she's so full of love mm-hmm. and what she's saying is love. Mm-hmm. And when I talk to you, it makes sense. Yeah. Why does it make sense? Like, what about that makes sense to you? I mean, she's using the uh, physical activity, particularly an incredibly difficult physical activity, as a way of getting to another dimension. I'm sure that she doesn't, I'm sure she goes to a place in her mind right away, you know, and and stays in that place for however long the ultra marathon is, you know. And, uh, and that, and that's the, her equivalent of a yoga practice or a martial arts practice or a practice in the arts, you know? Yeah. Uh, I would imagine. 
Yeah. I mean, you talked to her, I didn't. Well, and then and then she can get to that place in a day-to-day conversation yeah. too. She can access that. Ah. And when you can access that transcendence, you are full of more presence. You're full of more love. Mm. You're fu- full of more energy. How did she come to that? What was her journey to become, to decide to run yeah. like that? What What was her story? I think she had been running for 25 years or 24 years, and she knew that the, the world record was 23 marathons ah. in 23 days. And she said to herself, I think I could do that. And then she got there and she was like, I think I could do more. Huh. And so I think currently the ultra marathon world record for most consecutive ultra marathons in a row is 177 days greater than the marathon record because she wanted to push the boundaries for wow. what humans could do. And it's really interesting from talking to people is like, it's like you're building, like you're building blocks and you see this with runners a lot. Is like a runner will learn something and then the next generation will benefit from uh, it, uh-huh. like the four minute mile. Uh-huh. And so I think what you've done for creativity is given us a new standard to look at and a new place for, because in 2002, no one was talking about the muse or uh, the divine nature of creativity in the way that you talked about it. It seems like for me, I was seven years old, so what would I, <laughs> but, but it seems like the culture has shifted in terms of how uh. people talk about creativity. I think you're responsible for increasing the block. Uh. Well, you're very kind. I don't know if that's the case, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it seems like people were talking about that for a long time, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh. Well, how, how has your, like you're, you're very, it seems like a humble guy and unwilling to, accept some of the the responsibility sometimes but the the praise of your work where does that come from it's a good question i I really don't know i'm not sure that it's a good thing um but it's definitely uh uh i definitely when when people say uh kind things like that i definitely my first instinct is to deflect it you know and uh yeah, I'm not sure where that comes from. Uh, and why? I, I don't. I. I don't. I think you don't want to. Uh, uh, like I say, ideas come from someplace else, you know. And if you start taking credit for them, mm. the you know the gods don't like that, you know. Uh, so uh, maybe that's that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I mean, how would you compare this to Candace Burt and running the the 200 ultra marathons? It's like. You know, if I'm like, you did an incredible job, you pushed humanity forward in what you did. And she was like, well, I didn't do anything. I was just in service of what I thought I was supposed to do. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Like, I agree with that. (laughs) Yeah, and I agree with it too. But she can also accept her role in that. Mm. And her not accepting her role in that is doing a disservice to her stepping up. Mm. Do you understand? You didn't have to write these books. But you did, and it changed humanity in a real way. And you can accept your role in that without being cocky or feeling like mm. you are the all-knowing, all-powerful. Mm. Well, I can accept that I that I did write those books, and you know that they've helped they've helped people. You know, so I can I can accept that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what would you say to people struggling uh, with feeling like they're not? capable or feeling like feeling like they can't accept the praise or accept uh the kind words people say to them hmm um i'm not sure i i don't know the answer to that yeah uh, well if you were i don't advising, know what i would say to myself exactly yeah. so if yeah. you were advising um i know you don't have any children but you if you were advising your son about that what would you say um I think I would still sort of have my same attitude toward it, uh, that um, it is important to maintain perspective of what your contribution is, you know, that you're, um, you're uh, a channel for things that are coming, coming through you, and your job is just to be articulate and, and to put it out there as best you can and... Uh, um, 
without expecting any rewards from it or anything like that, just trying to, try, like I say, when I wrote The War of Art, it really, I was writing for myself. I just wanted to put out, just wanted to put my ideas on paper and, uh, and see what I thought. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't have any thoughts of really influencing lots of people or anything like that. I mean, it sort of came about that uh, people would come to me in real life, friends, and say, before I wrote The War of Art, and say, um, I've got a book in me, I really want to write it, you know, and I would sit down with them and try to, like, psych them up. I would, you know, to, to encourage them, you know, I'd stay up till 2 in the morning or something, and, uh, um, and I would tell them about, I would kind of warn them about this fact, this, this thing called resistance with a capital R mm. that I experience, you know, and say, you know, you got to gear up for this mentally that you're going to run into this and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and I would try to psych them up to do, to do their work, you know. And, of course, nobody ever did it. Nobody ever listened to me. They all kind of succumbed to, to their own resistance. So finally I just said, fuck it. I'm just going to write this down. And the next time a person comes to me, I'll say, here, read this. So that, that's, you know, how that, how that came about. But I just, I sort of said, I, I, like I said, I felt like I was the only one, you know, experiencing this, or maybe a few other people. Uh, so it was a surprise to me that it resonated as far and wide as it did. Wow. And when you look back and you, it, it's almost like you, you were serving as the, the therapist role back then too. Yeah. In what ways have people's problems changed? Ah. Uh-huh. I don't think they have. I don't think they ever will. Wow. And my problems haven't changed either. I mean, right now we're talking and uh, it seems like, oh, I'm like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I know the, the answers, but it's not true. I mean, I'm working on a new book now and resistance is kicking my ass. And I'm still having to, I feel like I'm right back where I was at the start. And I think that's the way it always is. Everyone, every Every new album, I'm sure Bruce Springsteen has to, you know, finds himself in a new place with new problems, and maybe he can bring in some experience from the past, but he's still up against it again. It's a new, a, a new form, a new thing that's resisting him. You know, um, so uh, yeah. I, by, by no means do I want to pass myself off as any kind of, you know, master that's gotten by this. It's it's just as strong against me now as it was. And the challenges are just as tough. And it should be. that. That's the way it should be. It's by virtue of you solving your own problems and continuing to solve your own problems that you can talk about it. Yeah, I think so. That You may have had some success in the past or you've evolved a few principles. You've observed a few principles that you're trying to, you know, put forward to other people so that they can say... Uh, they can answer, oh, is that true for me too? Do I feel that same way too? And if so, you know, what what can whatever Pressfield has learned, how can that help me? How can I ride on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, in the topic, to switch gears here a little bit, I want to talk to you about mentors and mentorship because I think a lot of pe- young people listen to this podcast and they're curious about how do I, how do I find a mentor? How do I, what is the right mentor for me? Is there any answers there that you could give by way of mentorship? Uh, you know, it's funny. I was I'm just thinking about this yesterday because, like I say, I'm here in Austin. I did a podcast yesterday with Ryan Holiday, and his mentor is Robert Green. Which, um, if if anybody is listening, to this doesn't know about that, they should find out. And he actually, um, Ryan actually worked as a researcher for Robert Green and was kind of. Uh, exposed and would be able to ask questions of him and watch how he worked and really be, he really became a mentor even though they didn't actually use those words. I haven't had anybody like that. But what I have had is um, bosses, people that I knew that I admired, that I, that I watched. Sometimes people would take me under their wing for a, a little while and kind of teach me things. Um, and a lot of times it wasn't even about writing, you know. It was about, uh, you know, a boss in some other field. Um, and if you had even asked me at the time, was they a mentor to me? I probably would have said no, or I would have scratched my head. I wouldn't, hadn't even thought about it. But looking back on it, I would say, oh, yeah, I really learned, you know, that person really helped me. You know, I, and, and um, I probably had 40 mentors over the course of that I, including friends that were peers, you know, not always people that were older than me. Um, 
and you learn something different from from each one. And what are you looking for in that person? I don't know if I'm even, I mean, there's some people that you admire right away, right? Maybe you're working on a job uh, and you see somebody that's really good at the job and you, and you watch them, you know, like, how do they do that? You know, how, you know, what are they, how do they know it? You know, so you study them, you know, um, like uh, when I, I had about a 10 year career as a screenwriter and for five of those years, I worked as with a partner, an older writer, a guy named Ron Shusset, who did the first Alien, which I'm sure you've never seen. Um, and um, one of the things he would he would do was I would come up with like, we were trying to solve some problem in the story. And I would come up with like 10 ideas. And he would pick one. And it was the right one. And I and I couldn't tell. I thought all ten were like either bad or good. And I and I would just watch him again and again. And I go, how do you know that? You know, because it would prove true. You would watch as the story unfolded. Ah, that was the right one. He picked it. And I still don't know to this day how he did it. But I just knew I got to study. You know, what is he looking at? You know. And then the other thing that another thing. Well, he taught me a lot of things, but but. Uh, he had certain enthusiasms, um, like he loved film noirs, you know, or detective. He loved these old detective movies from the 40s or something like that. And they were movies I'd never even heard of, you know. But he loved them so much that, you know, I, I would go along with him. And, uh, and then I fell in love with him, too. And so he really expanded the whole range of what I was interested in and, and what, I, what I could learn from. And that's just kind of one one person there were many many others that helped me in things yeah well like from what you say it's a good mentor expands your world because you trust them and it takes you to a place that you otherwise wouldn't have gone yourself had you not had them as a role model yeah or they have some gift or some skill that that is a mystery to you and you watch them do something you know you go, how did he know you know to pick that thing and not that thing and uh I think you can learn those. It's sort of you learn it by osmosis in some crazy way, you know. But I've also had, like I said, mentors that were peers or even younger than me that I would learn from. And what about those experiences like Simon Sinek? I know either you were writing a book or he was writing a book and you would go back and forth. And like, what what are you discussing in those meetings and what is that actually like? Uh, That would be uh, cool if those were recorded, I mean. uh, Yeah. And published after the fact. Yeah. He... uh, he did me, I forget whether I asked him to this favor or whether he, but uh, I was working on a, on a new book a couple of years ago, and he volunteered to uh, be a sounding board for me, you know, which a lot of people do for other people, you know, but um, so I sort of pitched him the book, you know, like you'd pitch to your agent or something like that. And, you know, he had some really smart things to say that sort of, you know, pointed me in a, in a direction, you know. So, and and I really respect his intelligence and just the way he thinks. I mean, his ideas, I go, where did he get that idea from? You know, it's, uh, how does he know so much, you know? Um, so those are, those are what mentors are about, you know, I think. Yeah, it, it it's really, it's interesting because today, if you don't have access to some of the, these people, you have the ability to listen to them. Yeah, like, true, like podcasts. Is, exactly, yeah. like, that's remarkable. That it is literally remarkable. Joe Rogan can be your mentor. You can have his ideas in what he is going to do if you listen to all of his episodes, right? Yeah, or his guests. Right. You know, you listen to, I mean, I've listened to a bunch of podcasts where I, somebody I never heard of is the guest. And I go, wow, you know, you know, like the person, the runner, the ultra marathon runner, you know? You go, where, where did they come from? You know, this is so great that I get a chance to listen to it. Yeah. Which is even better than TV in the old days because you didn't have these one-on-one long conversations, you know. It wasn't as real. I mean, they because they had commercials and you know, yeah. How but, has the changing media changed human beings? Well, that's a good question. In a way, it's in a way it's good because you're exposed to mentors, but in a way, like we were saying, it can be tough because it puts more pressure on people, and you feel like, oh man why am I not like so-and-so, you know, or, um, but most of the people that you find or that I, when I look at a podcast and I say, oh boy, that could be a mentor to me as somebody I admire, they've been doing it for a long time. Yes. You know, there are people that are like 50 years old or something like that, or, and they've been through hell, you know, 
They've had addiction issues, God knows what, you know, and finally came out the other end of it. But it just takes time, I think, you know? Yeah, like Candace Burt. She, it took her 26 years to accomplish what she did as, for, as a runner. Yeah. And you look at that and you're like, that seems pretty cool, but it, it takes a long time. Yeah. And on that point, I think part of your success is in finding the ability to sit with the boredom of it. And obviously you, you've played different roles and times in your life when you haven't been able to sit with the board and going from east coast to west coast and taking all these jobs but when you have been able to sit with the boredom you've transcended that you know that's a really great point danny and it's a point robert green makes too mm -hmm. that so much of and uh of succeeding at something is the daily grind you know I mean, Michael Jordan didn't learn to do that turnaround fadeaway jump shot the first time he did it, right? And even reading about how Kobe Bryant had to study film of Michael Jordan and and talk before he learned, you know, what's the footwork? Where does one foot go? Where does the other one go? And then shoot it, you know, 10,000 times, you know, or Steph Curry. He didn't just start making those from that range the first time he did it. That's like again and again and again and again. And... uh and to sit with that tedium is, uh, it's a skill they don't teach you. You don't get rewarded for that. They don't teach you that in school. You know, there's not even really a name for it. Um, but it's, uh, that's why things take so long, I think, that, um, you know, if you're going to be a concert pianist, how many times, how many scales do you have to play? You know, how many times do you have to play Beethoven's Ninth? You know, however many, 104,000 notes in a certain order with a certain, you know, the keying and whatever you call it with your feet and and the, the emotion. How many times do you have to do that? I mean, if you think of it, that these concert pianists sit down without music in front of them and they play that thing, you know? How do you get to that? And if you're impatient and you are when you're young, it's tough to think, you know, but... That's reality. It's just to get to, to mastery of something, um, which is another great Robert Green book, Mastery, it takes, takes years, takes patience. And of course, you know, there's no way to, there's no shortcut to that. You just have to do it. And I think that's why I'm, I'm attracted to people who have been doing things longer, because I believe, and I'm curious to get your perspective on this, it's more reflective of someone's soul mission the mission that they were placed here on this earth to do if they've been doing it longer because you are forced to confront all the times when you want to stop when you want to quit i mean i've noticed in my own journey with the podcast there were times when i was like i don't want to do this anymore <laughs> i can't do this anymore and i'm gonna not podcast for a month and then I, I i don't podcast for a month and then i get physically ill uh, i i'm sick and uh -huh. i'm like oh god i i have to do this uh -huh. otherwise i'm going to be hurt in some way and that is what you see when someone's been doing something for 10 years. It's often they've taken a, a month off or a week off and they're like, I can't not do this. Yeah, I think it's exactly true. It is a calling, whatever it is for each of us. Um, and once we find it, it's just like you say, sometimes you just can't do it anymore, right? You hit a dead spot, you just got to stop. But it's, it's what you were put here for. So you are, you do get sick. I get physically sick, you know, until you get kind of get back to it. And um, so that that is the only way I think that you can get through that tedium. It's got to be, this is what you were put on the planet to do. There's no other, you don't have a choice, you know. You just got to keep doing it, even though it's, it's boring, you know. Nobody g gives a shit about it, you know. There's no rewards for it. There isn't even a name for it, you know. But you got to do it. What have you learned about people overcoming resistance and romantic love? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, could you elaborate on that? What do you, I'm not sure I know what you mean by that, Danny. I'm curious about um, like how some people are in their creative calling or they're in a, a pursuit that they're, they're on a, a path or a mission. And then how does that relate to them finding someone that they spend the rest of their life with, if at all? Uh, have you noticed those things uh, 
be in sync in your own life? It, you know, there, that's a really great question. I've, I've seen it be not necessarily positive. Mm. Um, for instance, um, I had a girlfriend a few years ago when I was first really starting to try to write. You know, I was working at a job at an ad agency, but, you know, in every spare moment I was, you know, I was committed to trying to write fiction or whatever it was. And my girlfriend began undermining me and trying to, you know, sabotage me. And uh, it took me a while to kind of become aware of this. And we finally broke up. And I've, my assessment of this was that uh, she had her own resistance and seeing me to her own calling that she was not fulfilling and seeing me trying to work was a reproach to her. So she felt like, I got I to gotta stop this guy from doing it. Now, and the proof of the pudding is about... Five or six years later, she's now a fine artist. She finally left where she was, went to Santa Fe, actually, and she's been a fine artist for years, and she's really great. And in other words, she finally did face her own calling, and she's never, she wouldn't, and now she wouldn't sabotage anybody. She's now become like a mentor to people. Um, so I think sometimes that can be, it can be a bad thing. Um, other times, I think, in romantic love, if one person is truly pursuing their calling, you know, an actor, a filmmaker, whatever it is, they might attract somebody that really wants to do that themselves but doesn't have the guts to do it yet. And so they're sort of hoping that some of it will rub off on them. If it's my girlfriend, if it's my boyfriend, and, and he's an actor, well, maybe I'll get that too. And in that case, I think you have to ask yourself, well, is it really love or is it something else, you know? Um, the shadow career in that case yeah. is the relationship. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. That's fascinating. And, you know, it'd be interesting to study real-life relationships like that. How do they, how do they, uh, how do they evolve? Does the, the person that wants to do it, do they finally do it? And if they do, do they sort of, I mean, one of the things that uh, Robert Greene talks in his book, Mastery, about is about um, if you're an apprentice to a mentor, and he says that's kind of the usual path to mastery, there comes a point where you have to leave the mentor, where you have to transcend the mentor, right? You have to say, hey, you know, fuck you, I'm not doing it your way, I'm going to do it my way. And I wonder in romantic love if at some point the the lover that's been modeling themselves after the other one has to say, hey, I got to go out and and do it myself and I got to leave you. Yeah. I don't know. And, and maybe that's part of the reason also you find actors also date actors so much is because they both overcome the resistance and therefore they're looking at somebody almost as a peer versus somebody who's trying to use them as their shadow creature. Yeah, I think that's true. It's like you feel, I think a person that's operating at a high level hopes to find somebody else doing it too, so then it eliminates that that dynamic of a kind of a parasitic dynamic, you know, they each, or even if they're not in the same field. Mm. You know, an actor might marry a photographer and say, ah, she's going off doing her thing in, you know, Vietnam or whatever it is. Got God bless career. her, you know, let her go over there. You know, I'm doing my thing here. And when they come together, they're, they're, they're equals, you know, they're peers. Yeah. And they're all, theoretically, anyway, I don't know about this, but <laughs> theoretically, then they can just be together because they love each other, not because they want something from the other person. Yeah. That, I, I think there's really something to that. I, it's a pleasure talking to you. I'm so grateful for the opportunity, and I, I really admire you and your your gifts, and thank you for giving them. Um, I like thanks, to, thanks for the great questions, Danny. Yeah, my pleasure. I like to end these podcasts with challenges. A challenge points to the place in your heart you believe people should take this conversation and actually do something with it, because you listen to us talk, but like, what are you actually going to do from the conversation? Does a challenge come to mind from mm. everything we've spoke about or something we haven't covered yet? Um I mean, if, if a person 
is is struggling because they're uh, trying to find a calling or trying to find that thing that's their that's their thing. I would just say, uh, ask yourself what you're most afraid of. Mm. Um, wow, for you it might be that book. You know, ask yourself what you're most afraid of, and then kind of rally yourself or begin to think, how am I going to do that? Mm. You know, um, accept the fact that you got to do it at some point. And then, uh, you know, like for instance, if, if it were, if, if you wanted to be a concert pianist, you'd have to sort of, or if you wanted to be a brain surgeon, have to at, kind of ask yourself, well, what, do I, what are the steps, right? If I want to be a brain surgeon, if that's my calling, I guess I got to go to college and I got to do pre-med. Mm. And then I, or, you know, um, or another way to look at that thing is who, what work or of art or something or whatever it is do I really admire? Do I really wish I had done? Or what, what artist do I say, oh, man, I wish I was, I knew that person. I wish I could be that person. And, and ask yourself, what, what of that, what aspect is it that really grabs me? You know, what, uh, is it their courage to do it? Is it um, their generosity of spirit to do that? Is it uh, what is it about that? If you if you can if you can boil it down to that, and then you know somehow try to make a connection to that. And I also would say I don't know if this is answering your question, Danny. Um, to be aware, there's another dimension of reality, yes. and that that's where ideas come from. And to uh, try to connect to that in your own way through meditation, through your dreams, through um, just intuition to what you um, what you just sense in yourself, uh, and and to take pressure off yourself if you're young, you know it takes a while. You got to go through a lot of it. to be a concert pianist. You know it's going to take 15 years, right? There's no getting around it. Um, you know, be you know take some pressure off yourself that you don't have to do it tomorrow. Yeah. Well, when was the first moment you realized that there was another dimension? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think I always knew it wow. because I couldn't get to it. Hmm. Uh, I knew that I was trying, I was beating my head into the wall, trying to, to come up with an idea, trying to make an idea work. And, uh, hmm. You know, here's maybe this is the answer. Um, just occurring to me now as we're talking about it. Um, I was in New York. I was maybe 40 years old, 30 something years old. I've been trying to write novels for 20 years, totally failed at everything. And uh, I was, uh, I had just finished um, the third one that I'd done, each one taking about two years full time. And it went absolutely nowhere. And I didn't have. I knew I couldn't do it again. I couldn't put in another two years. I saved money for two or three years. I couldn't do it again. And uh, so somehow I had an idea. So let me write a screenplay instead. I've never done that. And I thought, and I'd always written what I, I felt like you had to write something that was true and it was about yourself. You know, it had to be. And I thought, fuck that. I'm never going to write anything about myself ever again. I'm going to make this up. I'm going to pull it out of my ass, whatever it is. And I wrote uh, a story about prison um, that I know nothing about. And I found, as I was writing it, that it was working. <laughs> you know? that You I, knew it was, it was working. I, I knew it. I knew it. I, I could just tell. And uh, so I thought, this is coming from someplace other than my normal bullshit, you know? And I think that was a moment for me when I felt like... Uh, I finally been able to turn on the tap, and water's actually coming out of it, and the, and it was just making it up, just thinking it doesn't have to be true. I don't have to know about it. I I can just make it. I can just wing it, and and it'll work on the page. And then people will read it and say, you know, wow, that sounds so true to me. So that might have been the moment for me. Now that I think about it, and it's not about me. It's not about you. Not about me. Right? Not at all. Yeah, and there that, was no person, me, in the story at all. And I thought that was totally liberating for me. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's a very helpful thing yeah. to help people. Yeah. Whatever they're doing in the rest of their life. I know you got a new book out, which is very exciting. Uh, 
the daily press field. I mean, it's a compilation of all the books, and it's one day a piece, and it's a really cool. Like any page you open up to, it's like, wow, there's there's something in here that is insightful and interesting. What was the process like in in writing this book? Um, the the idea behind this book is that it's sort of like what we've been talking about here all along. Uh, where you're kind of pulling from, oh, when you were at the Board of Art, what, you know, when you, did you have an experience with, with a mint, that kind of thing. Yeah. I sort of thought, let me get it all, let me put it all together in some sort of way that actually makes sense. So the Daily Press Field is, this is actually Ryan Holiday's title that he gave to me. So it, it starts like the first chapter is just called Day One. Mm-hmm. And it says, the first chapter is, Resistance Wakes Up With Me. And in other words, what I wanted this book to do would be, if you were trying to write your own book, or like maybe you are, Danny, to start on day one, and this book would kind of walk you through the whole sort of process. You know, so like when I say resistance wakes up with me, that's like first morning, first thing, you open your eyes, it's like, oh, fuck, what am I going to do, you know? So just to, to that day as you read it, the chapter hopefully will say to you, hey, the same shit happens to me. This is what, this is what I do. This is what, what you need to do. And then it's notorious with any kind of book that act two, halfway through, is hell, mm. right? You always are lost. It's always, it's always hell. Yeah. So it's the same thing in this book that the big part of the center is about that agony and how to get through it and then at the finish it's it's taking you to to what this is all about what the artist's journey is all about what the hero's journey is all about how to finish a book because then you're going to get or any project at all because then you're going to sabotage yourself like mad at the end Mm. and then the final 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 stuff is about what it what does it all mean Mm. you know um, we're trying to get ahead. We're trying to do it. But what does it all mean on the deepest level? And that's what the final few chapters are about, which is about making the art that you're trying to do a practice, a daily practice. And anyway, so that's – it's sort of like it, all of my books all put together into one. Yeah. And also fiction books as well. Um, the, this, a lot of my fiction is about warfare, mm-hmm. particularly ancient warfare. And the reason – that I think that's the case is because I think we're in a war up here, the war of art, right? Mm -hmm. And those books are about an external war, and this is about an internal war. But the lessons from those books apply directly, you know? Um, A story about, you know, ancient Rome or ancient Greece or whatever can be brought into the modern world in what you'll be doing when you finally do sit down and attack this book. So anyway, that's what the Daily Press Field is about. So that's going to be my challenge to everyone listening. Check out the Daily Press Field. Uh, yeah. Where can people get this? Uh, it'll be coming out for Christmas. Oh, wonderful. And um, actually, we're putting together, my uh, my girlfriend Diana and I have a little publishing company, and we're putting it together, uh, hopefully, as a, as a, that it could be a gift. So it comes in a, in a box with, uh, or you can order it that way, with a workbook that goes along with it, with all kinds of other little goodies that would make, I hope, a great gift for somebody like you that's right on the brink of, of, of tackling something. And, uh, and you can also buy it just straight on Amazon. But it's not out at the moment as we're talking now. It's October 18th. Mm-hmm. It'll be out at probably mid-November, something like that. Mid-November. Awesome. Well, so Steve, if you could put this podcast out around that time, that would be great. I absolutely will. So huh. hopefully when you're listening to this, you can check out the Daily Press Field on Amazon or wherever you get it. And um, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, look at you as like somebody who has walked the path and you have shared your lessons and I've benefited from it and many other people have as well. So well, I'm happy to be your grandfather, Danny. <laughs> Let's talk just for a minute as we don't have to... I mean, maybe we do for no. time. I don't know. But okay. um, where do you stand as far as this new book? Is it something you think mm. you're going to do in a year? Is it something you feel like, oh, God, i got to do it now? Uh, what's, what's your mindset? I feel like it'll come when it's ready. Ah. 
Um, That's a good mindset. Yeah. Everything. Every, I'm a huge believer that the moment is perfect the way it is. Uh-huh. And that doesn't mean that we won't strive for a better future. We're doing that in this moment. This uh-huh. moment is perfect, and we're also striving for a better future uh-huh. because we're going to post this conversation. Uh-huh. And so I kind of feel the same way about the book. Mm. I think that's that's a wise way to look at it. Maybe your your podcasting journey is is evolving mm-hmm. and taking you to whatever place when you when the moment will come. You know, I hope that's the case. Yeah, well, I mean, what would you recommend as I, as ways to get the idea and have the idea more clearly? One thing I, I would say, like we were talking about, is pay attention to your dreams. Mm. If you don't buy that Robert Johnson book, Inner Work, I will and you know, uh, it's a it's a muscle that as you use, you start to get better. Like people, a lot of times will say, "I can't remember my dreams." Well, you will if you tr- if you start make a you know if you start recording and have your phone beside you, um, and and then uh, pay attention to, to them. And but I know you do that anyway. You're meditating, you know, and and pay attention to what's out there in the in the ether. And I, I think all of us are creative in that we all get have ideas all the time, yeah. but some people don't pay attention to them yeah. or dismiss them. And, you know, a great idea will come in the shower, and they'll think about it for two minutes and they'll forget about it. Whereas I think an artist, Bruce Springsteen or Taylor Swift or whatever, is always waiting for that. You know, they're listening and when something comes in, they wake up and they put it, they write it down, you know? So that, cause it's like dreams. You know how you forget dreams so easily, you know? You say, oh, I'll never forget that. It's so vivid. And then 10 minutes later, you can't remember anything. It's the same thing, I think, with ideas that come to you from, from the other dimension. They're so easy to forget. You think, oh, I'll never forget that, but you do. So it's great to, to write it down. I mean, I've had the uh, occasion, I used to have a file called New Ideas. And I would just write them all down, you know, when they'd come to me. And then sometimes I would look at them like three months later and I'd suddenly go, wow, that is a fucking great idea. How did I forget that? You know, thank God I wrote that down. Yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, I'm just blathering on here, Danny. No, I appreciate that. And I think I use the notes on my phone as a way to do that. I also use Twitter. And just to get into my mind state of where I was at that time, just to have some sense. Yeah. Because if you don't keep a journal, if you don't write anything down, you have no, it's all ephemeral. Yeah. You forget that away. you've grown. Yeah. You forget that you've built something for yourself. Yeah. You forget that you've changed as a character. Yeah. And all those writings and the videos and the podcast, it's all as a way to serve my grandchildren someday to help show them the how I've evolved and changed and also give them the lessons. But it's also for myself of like, look at where I was and look at how where I'm going and look at the the through line. What's the same? What? Are, how are the questions the same? How are... what? So recording things is a magical, magical gift we've been given. And I, you got to take advantage of that in some way, especially if you're a creative person. Yeah. And we all are creative Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Okay. All right. That's a great note to end it on. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Thanks a lot, Danny. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. My pleasure. Okay.